Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tomás Jászajan, a theater critic and uh, curator from uh, Hungary. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to moderate this uh, discussion and I introduce very shortly our guest uh, today. Uh, Claire Marshall is from the UK. As you can see already, uh, uh, she is representing Calm to Co, uh, which is an organization uh, part of the National Rural Touring Forum. And she will tell very soon some more details on it. We have Yulia Popovici here, uh, who is a, a Romanian performing arts critic and, uh, and an expert uh, on European and Romanian cultural policies. And, uh, and who is, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't uh, manage to memorize. So, uh, part of the National Reco Recovery and the Resilience Plan, somehow, but she will, she will uh, 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 tell us what does it mean practically. And we have Chongor Kerlu as well here. Uh, and actually, in this uh, round table, we are not representing Shoshin. But you, you are here because you know some more rural touring models uh, from Europe that can be uh, interesting for us. And I am I'm very grateful to Miki Bonista and uh, our uh, previous uh, uh, participants of the previous uh, discussion because during this very exciting and interesting talk there were some keywords, if you like, uh, that are closely connected our topic, uh, just to mention a few, like reaching the audience or returning to the community, um, what are the shows easy to set up, um, what about the institutional background, the, the new ways or new forms of communication between audiences and spectators, the needs of the communities, um, and so the reliable person, we talked about this as well. So these are just a few, um, few terms, a few keywords. Um, I think we will, we will rely. But first of all, I, I would like to ask Claire to make a short presentation of, of what is Kant Cove, because she prepared a wonderful PPT for you. And of course, uh, we'd like to know more about the National Rural Touring Forum. So 
I'm mainly going to talk about Come to Cove and the model that we run, because obviously that's what I know the best. But all of the touring schemes really run on a very similar model in the UK. So my presentation is really to remind me of what I do to show you some pictures. Um, so I've got to navigate now, pressing the buttons and speaking to the microphone. So bear with. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, so Palm to Cove is um, Cornwall's performing arts scheme, as I said. So we're one of the national net network. So um, there's just a lovely picture to illustrate a bit of the Cornish landscape. So we're a very rural part of the UK. Um, there's a lot of economic deprivation in Cornwall. It's seen as a beautiful place because a lot of people go on holiday there, and it is a beautiful place to live. And I, I grew up there and I live there. But um, the, core, the population of Cornwall are, you know, large, large parts of our population um, live, live in poverty, and there are people who grow up four miles away from the beach who've never been to the beach before. So it's a, 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 a county of extremes. You know, there's a lot of wealth, and second homes are a big um, part of our um, economy. So lots of people come there on holidays, and then they. They buy homes that the local people can't afford to buy. So lots of our villages are suffering from a sort of drain of the population. And we exist in a way for the Cornish population. So we our program is generally in the non-tourist season. So our, our program events is primarily for the local population of the tourists. Not that we don't love the tourists, we do. So, as a, as a national network, the NRTF has around 30 member schemes, as I say, from, from Cornwall up to um, Scotland and the whole of Wales as well. And so, on a local level, we might be very small scale in our village halls, and our networks are, are small, so our, our, um, the scale of the work that we program is small, but as a whole, we have quite a large voice, a large footprint, and you know, a lot of turnover is generated through the work that we do. So as you can see, there are 30 schemes, 1,650 promoting groups, which are primarily volunteers. So most of our promoters are volunteers who live in their communities, and they give up 110,000 voluntary hours. And we show our events to around 330,000 people and over a million pounds is generated for lots of sales. This is in a typical year and this is basically pre-pandemic numbers. We're still struggling a little bit to get back to those numbers. But we exist in order to enable the communities to present something that's a little bit different to what they should do so we financially support them. We're funded to do that. Um, and we kind of... Our ethos is very much doing with, not doing to. So we work with the communities. As I say, they're volunteer promoters who live in the communities. They choose what they want. We don't tell them what they have to program. It's it's very much done at grassroots level. Um, but we are funded so that we can pay the artists a, a, a professional fee. So that we don't subsidise the artists. We pay them a fair wage we subsidise the communities so that they do not have to take financial risk on putting on a professional event. We kind of feel that just because you live in a rural area, there's no reason that you can't have access to really high quality professional touring work. So we work so that we can bring performers to very small communities. And um, as I said, we, we subsidise that risk for the promoter. So how does it work? Our scheme works, and as I say, most of them work along the same lane, um, same models. We as an organisation, and we're very small scale, there's myself and one other person in our team, we put together a programme of events, a menu we call it, and we um, put that together from seeing work, um, having contact, having networks, and having experience of working with companies, you know, there are um, companies that work in rural touring throughout their career, so they are they they um, create their work with rural touring in mind, and um, we don't see that as a limitation. We don't see the fact that it's small scale and 
global as being a limitation on the kinds of work that we offer. We try and challenge our audiences as much as entertain them. So we put together this menu, we try and get a broad range of different types of events, and then we offer these out to our promoters, we invite them to a menu party, we come together twice a year in an event just like this. I'm standing here with PowerPoint, they're sitting there listening to what we're presenting, everybody brings a plate of food, we share it with the interval, artists come and um, perform little extracts or speak about their shows, and they meet the promoters during the break, and there's this really lovely sort of hub of conversation where everybody kind of gets to know each other a bit better. Um, and then they choose one event per season that we subsidise and we encourage them to look others. So we've got experienced promoters in our network and they are quite happy to take a risk on, on certain shows that they know that they can sell and then ask Cantico to support one that's a little bit out of their comfort zone. And that's what we love is when we kind of offer out a range of things on a different subsidised model. So that's just a little picture of our team, and we had four of us, now we're going to two, um, and we made a film, so if you're interested in seeing it, it's a sort of love letter really to come to Hope that we made last year on our anniversary, and it's on our website, so please um, have a look and watch it at, um, in your leisure. So um, a typical, so here are some stats, I always love stats, I, I kind of, we, we take a lot of data from our audiences and from our promoters and artists and every now and again I crunch those and I look at the pictures and the graphs and I think, oh, yeah, it is amazing what we do. So we typically have around 8,500 people attending, around about 115 events per year, so we average about 72. Um, audience numbers in each show and that varies because some of our halls are tiny and a maximum capacity is sell out audience is 50 people um, and then we work in town halls as well which are larger um, so they can have up to 400 people but it's generally our average size of venue is around about 120 now. Oops. Um, as I said before, we pay artists a full fee, so they don't have to take a risk or do a box office split with the promoter. Um, we um, spend around £65,000 of, um, of our budget each year on artist fees, which is about um, well over half of it. And that's then on artists that are from Cornwall, so we have quite a healthy network of artists making work in Cornwall. We also, we kind of see it as our job really to, to bring artists from up the line, or it's further out, outside of within the UK and even internationally, we bring artists into Cornwall so that we can um, give our audiences access to like a really good wealth of talent from, from all over. Um, ticket sales are the second um, biggest part of our budget, so we get funding from the government and the Arts Council, so we have public funded money which we put into the, to the scheme. We're also supported by our local authority, and then we generate a uh, next income. So the way the finances work is the village hall will pay us 80% um, of the box office takings that they make on the show, and they keep 20% of the box office for their own.
coming out and being with friends and family in the community is really important to our audience. Um, our reputation, comes both reputation and performing arts is an important part of who I am. These all score really highly. Um, nobody really comes to our events for peace and quiet. <laughs> generally always know each other and they feel the sense that it's their space and that artists have been invited into their space. So when you're an artist performing in a rural touring venue, then um, it, I imagine it's quite a different experience to working in a flat box theatre. You, you're going into the space, the, the community come out and see you, but they kind of own the space, they want to talk to you because you've come into their space. So it's very rare that an artist will come in and leave without having um, had a sort of social time with the audience to help them clear away at the end of the night if they want the help or not. Um, sometimes they can stay overnight in the village so they'll be given a bed in a promoter's house or at some in the village and they'll be given a hot meal and really, really looked after. Um, in Cornwall we have a performing arts university, Hamlet University, and we have quite a lot of young artists coming out of there. Um, new graduates and emerging companies, so we'd like to support those and offer them a platform so that they continue to work in Cornwall. Um, so we support artists throughout all parts of their career. There are some really established artists um, living and working in Cornwall as well. We've been um, doing rural touring, small scale theatre performances all their careers, and there are um, others around, as I say, around. And as I said at the beginning, it's really important for us to feel that we're connected internationally. And so we have, um, as, a, as a southwest region in, in the UK, we have a really close connection to our southwest neighbours. And we often program tours from European companies um, who tour the southwest. So we make a coherent tour and it makes it much more um, valuable um, and cost effective for the company to come. And we are also mindful of our place in our in our in, in the cultural sector of Cornwall because Cornwall is you know, quite the creative industries are quite important to the local economy. We don't have apart from tourism, we don't have very much industry, but creatively we work, you know, we offer a lot of opportunities and so the Carter Co works as we are a network, we connect with our own cultural sector. Perfect, thank you very much. But hopefully that will give, that gives you a sort of general idea of what we Yeah, I think it gives more than a general idea because of, so after listening to your presentation uh, from an Eastern European perspective, you know, it feels like we are in the realm of utopia. So <laughs> thank you very much. It was, and, and that's, I think it was a good decision, a good suggestion from John Moore to start with this presentation today. Because now the question is on the table. Are there any other uh, countries in Europe, you know, or other systems, you know, um, that are so <coughs> mighty leveled and that have so many, uh, you know, promoters and artists and, and everything that work in a, in a so complex network like the, like the UK model? So what are your Yulia, I ask you about the Romanian situation, shortly of course, then we can ask John about the other part of Europe. Well, I have to... Yes, Okay. Uh, I have to, to start by saying that there is at least one country that takes advantage of it being very small to uh, have developed a wonderful system that I'm dreaming about. I'm talking about Estonia, which has a system uh, according to which Theatre that receives a subsidy um, has to perform um, to perform tours in the countryside, so that it is a national scheme because this one yet again it is very small, so that each uh, person can have uh, access to a performance within 50 kilometers of its residence, the his or her residence. Um, so there is uh, a national planning, let's say. Uh, there are certain productions that are done especially for touring because not every uh, village has the infrastructure for huge set design and so on and lighting and, and so on. Uh, and uh, there's a sort 
won't be named to this, and it covers the whole country. But again, Estonia is the size of Cluj, the entire Estonia. Um, <laughs> well, in Romania, we don't have uh, a system yet, and we don't know, we don't know uh, uh, how many people have access to, to a theater within no matter how many kilometers. Uh, mm, but we have a plan. Uh, the planning in general started the, there's a history of it. It starts in the dark times of communism when uh, theaters were uh, uh, supposed to, were asked to tour. And there were two elements of it in the 1980s, so starting with 1984. First, they had this uh, obligation of touring, and then starting with that year, they had covered their expenses uh, up to 70%. Uh, which meant that the, uh, the touring uh, got a new, a new importance because it had somehow gathering the money to cover such a large percent of self-financing. Uh, but at the same time, it was a time when uh, there was no heating and electricity uh, in a generous manner in Romania, something that we all remember now in the current context, uh, which means that uh, professional artists, and I'm, in that context by professional artists, I mean art, art, theater artists are more employed in theaters, in public theaters, uh, developed a sort of a uh, intense hate uh, towards touring, especially in the countryside, uh, which coupled with another event, something else that is related to the second part of the 70s and 80s, which is the, uh, a festival, a nationwide, nationwide festival called the Song of Romania that put on the same level professional artists and amateur artists, which developed for the professional artist, um, a frustration towards amateur theater, which means that we enter the 1990s with professional artists that hated going in the countryside and hated having somebody without a diploma in the theater. Um, the, 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 General displays towards amateur theater is still very vivid in Romania. You can almost feel it from the part of, of uh, again, professional theater. So, theater artists that are actually involved in um, the production and so on. Um, well, but in the same time, the countryside, the countryside had and still partially still has uh, a large infrastructure, uh, the, the famous uh, houses of culture. Uh, and so, jumping to 2009, uh, so, sort of 20 years after, when the, the, the hatred towards uh, touring in the countryside decided a little, or there was a new generation that didn't develop such a, hadn't developed such a hatred, uh, and a group of independent artists uh, first developed a pilot and then came to the Minister of Culture culture with the proposition of public policy for the reactivation of, of these culture, houses of culture for uh, touring theater. The project was called uh, 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 Touring in the Countryside, Touring uh, Agatsala. It was part of a sort of a, a, a whole vision about building communities through theater. Uh, by a group of, of young theater makers, both by Georgios to Irina de Zizit, at that point, Alice Monica Marinescu, some of them, uh, some of them, uh, some of them then developed some other lines of, of working that strictly related to, to this regulation of the house of, of the cultures. Um, uh, first, the, the, the pilot program meant that uh, they, uh, well, they produced a certain a performance, which was based, which was based on real facts about something that happened in a, a small uh, countryside school, and then they presented it in, in, in five 
part of the like, rural communities, uh, communities in which they had, let's say, some connections. So, in order, so they wanted to have rural communities, not to present them an outside product, artistic project. So somehow they were uh, they, they relied on personal connections. The, the, the birth village of the father of one of the artists and so on you can imagine. Uh, and actually uh, one of the one of the things I, I was several such performances in the black communities and what was absolutely marvelous it was that uh, it was the fact that it activated uh, different generations of, of members of the community. Some of them re uh, uh, having memories about the cultural activities in, the, in those places, the cultural houses of culture, uh, which went from theater performances from the city uh, to uh, popular music in which they were involved. Uh, but then the, uh, the Minister of Culture was changed. You know, we have a specialty in changing <laughs> ministries of culture and socks. Uh, and everything done. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, aspiring public policy. Uh, but then, a few years afterwards, there was another initiative that celebrated uh, 10 years, last year, I think, called Culture in the Bar, Cultura uh, and which is somehow uh, similar uh, in the idea of uh, presenting uh, a performance, a theater performance, not an educational project, not a therapy thing, not something related to vulnerable group groups. I will go back to that in a moment, in uh, But without using the infrastructure. Uh, because what happened between 2009 and 2015, something like that, uh, was that. Uh, uh, some of the houses of culture were rehabilitated but without a very precise purpose and others somehow disappeared into the night of the wedding organization. Um, and because uh, some of these houses of culture were very politicized by the connection, well, you know, the, the local political so they, want, they are doing this in the courtyard of one, of one person of the village or another. They are not going to places that, where they have personal connections. They develop these connections. They install themselves in the courtyard of a local. And they work with locals uh, in developing a performance that is actually done by them and they are, they are well, they are not amateurs. Uh, so they are professional actors, but in the new definition of it. So they are not employed. And uh, the addressability varies because what they, uh, well, uh, they are developing the performance there because they have a repertoire of several things and they want to adapt to the specifics and the needs of the community. And the addressability is as large as it's possible, so from children, without being children in this theater, so let's say 10 years old, uh, to older people. So, which means that a certain language is required uh, and, and, and so on. And uh, they are doing it with some financing from the National Culture Fund uh, and the, uh, a variety of local support. But actually, uh, Differently from what happened with uh, uh, in the countryside, they don't want a public policy and they don't want to deal with the, with the state. Uh, they are receiving these uh, uh, this, uh, funds from the National Culture Fund, which, okay, the maximum for uh, uh, performing uh, for performances, for the performance production, is uh, 17,000 euros. That's the maximum. And you have to cover everything. And because it is the only national source of money, uh, the competition is harsh. 
So now, with 17,000 euros, you have to uh, buy the cow, feed the cow, uh, kill the cow, sell the cow, and so on, you know, everything. Uh, but uh, they can, they receive this money because uh, at some point, uh, the, the, those in part of Tudui introduced the, among the, the, the criteria, the priority criteria to finance projects in, in uh, RPCME. Um, this, uh, you know, uh, contributing to places that are, don't have an access to culture. Uh, usually, it means uh, the developing uh, um, educational projects. Uh, but the problem with education, so we do have a line of, a line of production in theater based on educational projects. But again, this is something that is uh, disconnected for everything else. So, uh, uh, there's no policy on, we don't even know what part of the map is covered by these projects. We don't know. They are happening in some places. Uh, we uh, even uh, need to uh, see a situation where in the same village, the same community, after uh, a, huge, uh, a bigger project was developed there, two years afterwards, there was another project going there because they didn't know what happened previously. <laughs> um, so it is very disconnected because uh, the, how communities are chosen by the operators is very random. Independent communities in Denmark, uh, where uh, local authorities are not open, uh, where the distance is reasonable from where the artists come from, because with 17,000 euros, mm -hmm. you can come from Bucharest to the north, mm -hmm. north of the United States. Well, possibly. And uh, it starts, uh, uh, so the access to this kind of project for the, the members of the community starts when they reach like 14 years. There's nothing for over the 40 years. Um, what's going to happen with uh, the our episode? For those of you who don't know it, and I don't know who, who doesn't know it, <laughs> every country in the European Union has this recovery and resilience plan. Uh, and in the, the, with money from the European Commission and in uh, the recovery and resilience plan of Romania, there is one very small thing, which is a, a pilot program of financing for cultural projects in places with less than, having less than 50,000 people living in it. Where there is, a, a, no matter how little, co-financing from the local authority. Which means, well, local, very local, or regional. And uh, the fund is formed the, for this pilot project, which also will extract data about where these projects have, what's the national distribution, uh, so, which will also uh, uh, gather the information where are the, those local authorities willing to support something like that. Uh, and it has a, a, a budget of 4 million euros, which is more than the, the funds for one session of APCNA for all the arts. So that we have the, 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 the level of poverty here that and why we are trying to, well, turn one cow in ten cows with 70,000 euros. Um, so, whoever among you is interested, there's this problem, there's uh, uh, the draft of the guides for this program in the RPGMA, and uh, it will happen because if we don't spend this money, that's that's the nicest part of the current resilience plan. If you don't do it and if you don't spend that money, all the financing stops. So not doing this this program for financing pro cultural projects in small communities, Romania won't have money for highways.
was very intense. Yeah, it was very intense. Yeah, that, that was the word. I mean, thank you. Uh, so yeah, and you know, I was thinking maybe maybe I would, I would stop a bit uh, stronger because I think it uh, it makes sense to just to just to show how things work in Hungary. Actually, I brought. Uh, it's not a present, but I can, I can, I can hire it to you. Um, it's called Dirini Magazine. Um, it's a, it's a promotional material uh, for Dirini program, uh, which is uh, which is. Just take a look at it. Um, which uh, actually was made in 2020 to um, to send theater shows in Hungary uh, to the countryside. And uh, I'm very glad that Julia mentioned some uh, historical roots uh, of the Romanian situation. We also have to mention uh, just a few words. Uh, uh, also the old times or the, uh, the old times in Hungary because in 1950s, from the 1950s to the 1970s, there was a, a theater called State Dirine Theater in Hungary, and its aim was to send shows to the countryside. Uh, for those who, who do not know Dirine, um, she was an actress, um, so we can translate it as Mrs. Dairy. Uh, she was an actress in the mid 19th century, an iconic uh, actress of Hungarian culture. Uh, I think. Uh, the name of the program also uh, gives an impression to what, uh, uh, what uh, history or what tradition it goes back to. And uh, uh, this new DNA program, founded in 2020, uh, it was made by the National Theatre in Budapest. Uh, you know, in Hungary, we believe in, 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 in centralizing everything. So, uh, uh, so a nine-member committee uh, uh, closely connected to the uh, management of the National Theatre, they do decide on which shows uh, to present in the countryside, uh, and so on and so on. And now I just checked out their homepage and it says that in this uh, season, so the 2022-23 season, uh, you in the, or anyone in the countryside can order a show. Uh, they have like more than 100 shows um, uh, online uh, where you can, you can choose from. Uh, if you have a venue uh, and you can order these shows, there are different groups, I won't, won't go into details. Um, but uh, you know what is interesting? Uh, and, and, and maybe later we can talk about it, that um, uh, the DNA program, they pay for everything. I, feel, I mean, for the artists, for the venue, they pay every cost. Uh, when I go there as a spectator, I have to pay for a ticket for 200 forints, which is uh, half euro, so it's practically nothing. Uh, you know, the average ticket price, yeah, the ticket price in Hungary is like uh, 8 to 10 euros or for the more expensive shows it's like uh, 20, 25 euros, uh, so you can compare it with this half euro price. Um, where do they play? Well, this, uh, this network of, of, of houses of culture we also have in Hungary from the dark times, from the communist times, and you know, in the, in the last uh, 30 years, nobody used them actually because you know they are huge buildings with no real function. So uh, these shows are invited many times there, and you know it's a very, uh, I think it's a very exciting initiative because in, in Hungary uh, practically there is no cultural mobility. So everything is concentrated in Budapest, in the capital of Hungary. And in the countryside, it's it's very very difficult to uh, to see small independent productions. Of course, we have we have uh, the system of the so-called uh, stone theaters. It was uh, uh, made after the Second World War, and you know uh, we always say that the biggest um, uh, uh, I don't know, 
made of, of Hungarian theater is the, uh, uh, the system of these film theaters, uh, the, the, the ensemble, the repertory, and so on and so on. Um, but, um, but in the last decades, uh, nobody wanted to uh, 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 nobody wanted to deal with those people in the countryside who do not have the chance to see uh, 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 high quality theater show. And during the program wants to do something like that, but there are many many uh, uh, problematic uh, aspects uh, of this thing. Um, and there are very, uh, I would say, spectacular numbers, uh, of course, for the, for the last season, and they have huge plans. Uh, they have um, their own company, they have a brand new venue, very close to the National Theatre, actually. Um, they have all the money they need, uh, but it's, it comes all from above. So it has nothing to do with, with the communities with their needs, uh, their desires. Uh, someone from the center, from the National Theatre, decides what is good for you and what is not. Which is, uh, I think it's a very special Hungarian model. <laughs> <laughs> So, Chambor, now it's your turn, and uh, of course you don't have to go into details with all the other models you, 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 you know from Europe. I know you have some knowledge about the Italian, the Swedish, the, the Norwegian model, and of course uh, the Romanian model as well. Uh, but, um, so how can you connect to these, uh, these, uh, these thinkings uh, you, you heard before? Okay, um, so... Yeah, one of the models that I know of besides the, besides the UK model is uh, the Swedish one, which is also a national network, uh, covers the whole country, uh, in existence for several decades as well. Uh, one of the differences uh, compared to the English uh, model, uh, the Swedish one is called Riksteater, the, the big national one, and then this Riksteater has smaller agencies in the different regions. So you will have Riksteater in Badland and so on. Uh, but one of the big differences compared to the way it works uh, in the UK, where you are practically trying to collect a pool of artists uh, who they all develop their own work wherever they can, is that in Sweden, this Riksteater has a very big factory in Stockholm uh, of uh, several levels where they have uh, uh, rehearsal rooms and studios for artists to work in. So they basically commission artists to, uh, to, to do new work with rural touring in mind, so specifically for rural audiences. Um, and they give them these spaces in this, I don't know, four or five story uh, theater factory. Uh, they give them the money to, to, to pay themselves for their rehearsal work, for their creation, uh, and they give them the money to, to, uh, to make these productions, which then get toured uh, in the network. Um, and this is all state funded. Um, and so, sort of, you don't have to always uh, uh, put forward an application um, and so on. This system is, is rock solid. Uh, it, is, it, it is funded. You can, you can count on it as an artist that if you wish to engage with this kind of work, if you are not only thinking about Milano and Sydney and New York, uh, then you have the opportunity to do it. And this is, it's work. You can live from it and it has value. Um, okay, another uh, model that I know and I would like to mention is the Norwegian one, which uh, they have a program called the Cultural Rucksack. This is a program destined, uh, uh, aimed not at um, adults, but at children, 
They work together with all the schools in Norway. Again, it's a, it's a national model with national funding, with regional um, agencies working uh, um, in, with the schools in their uh, region. Um, and this uh, cultural rucksack uh, basically allows each school in the country to host at least one professional performance a year for, for the pupils. So uh, what is valuable for me in this model is that the way the pupils get to see a performance and come in contact with the artists and with different art forms, not just theater, but also dance or, or music, uh, is not accidental, is not relying on if I know a school principal, or in the, in the school where I used to go, I still know the principal, so I will go to her. But if I don't know the, the principal in the school next door, then I will not go to them. So it, there is this accidental, is it going to happen or is it not going to happen? So here you would have schools where the pupils have the chance to watch, I don't know, five or ten performances per year in their own school, so they don't have to go to a theater theater comes to them, um, and then there are schools where they don't get to see any performances at all. So this is why such a model for me is very exciting, because it, again, it, it gives continuity, and it gives stability, and it gives a sort of a guarantee that you will have access to it every year, year by year. And then another model is the uh, Italian one. Um, I received a PowerPoint from our Italian partners, but maybe it's... Maybe, okay, maybe we can uh, uh, just see a few slides from, from that. Um, this model... Uh, in Italy they have regional organizations. So uh, one of these is uh, AMAT, Associazione Marchigiana Attività Teatrali, and so they work in the Marche region of, uh, of Italy. And there are several other similar uh, agencies or organizations in, in uh, other uh, regions. And these organizations, again, they receive money from the state in order to fund and finance artistic activity in their region. So this model is not just about rural, uh, uh, rural touring. Here you can see the region where, where they where AMAT develops uh, their work and the different provinces that, that make up uh, the region. It's not just about rural touring, so going to very small villages. You would have towns, bigger towns, smaller towns, but uh, again, it's this idea that you don't have to go to the, to, to the, to the big center, you know, to the big cultural center, for instance, like Cluj. Um, or to the capital, Budapest, to Bucharest, and so on. Uh, but you can have access to art and culture in, in other uh, smaller towns and villages as well. Um, so their funds come from ticketing, income from spectators, sponsors, uh, public money from the Ministry of, of Culture, um, and this money goes into making uh, new productions, into programming, and other uh, activities, like pedagogical uh, uh, educational activities. Um, here we could see uh, that in 2019, for instance, Amat uh, had 823 shows in that year. Um, and there we can also see the funds that they were dealing with. So again, if I compare this to, I don't know, 17,000 uh, euro, it, there is a difference. There is a difference. <laughs> a slight difference. Um, and they, as, as I said, it's not just about theater, it's also about dance, about music, about circus, contemporary circus, uh, different interdisciplinary <laughs> projects. <laughs> Um, they do contemporary theater, contemporary dance, uh, uh, contemporary you know, 
music, circus, and so on. These are some of the projects that AMAT was involved in, uh, European uh, projects. One of them is the Sparse, which you can see in the down right uh, corner is one uh, Creative Europe funded project that Shoshin was also involved in um, in the last three years where we were trying to, to develop, develop and implement a similar model to the, to the English one. Um, and then there are, there are, of course, other kind of, of projects as well, projects for the elderly. Um, this, they are trying to make uh, one of the towns a capital of culture. So this is the this is the just the presentation that our partners sent through, which I wanted to show you briefly. Um, these are the the models that I know of, that I can think of, uh, and I can talk about generally, uh, not too specifically. And also maybe just shortly to add to 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 what Julia was saying is uh, uh, about the cultural shooter. Uh, for instance. We, Shoshin, as I said, we, are, we try to develop this model for us. For instance, it's important to have this state funding. It's important to have a, a, a network. It's important to be able to count on that money. Um, so from this perspective, as even though being guerrilla is very uh, inspiring and romantic, I would still, me personally, I still believe in a system, a network, uh, which is publicly funded and which guarantees access to people, uh, for people to culture and arts. Again, so that it's not accidental. And I just wanted that to add one more thing to, the, to this uh, model of the 80s touring. There were state theaters in Romania which continue to, to implement this model, even in the 2010s. For instance, uh, the, the theater from Mirkuri uh, you know. Only the Hungarian-speaking theaters because they serve a community. So this could be, yes. Uh, but Bartolis <laughs> uh, uh, Gabi, who is a member of, of this uh, theater of, from Mirkuri is uh, here with us. So maybe at a certain point we can, we can uh, uh, connect her to say some words about did they really hate doing it? <laughs> and and where, where the theater is today, in 2020, with regard to, to this practice? Um, yeah. Um, I, uh, there, are, uh, there were, for instance, there are several theaters, children's theaters, that are still doing it. Uh, outside big cities, for instance, the Chilean theater in Budapest, which also is bilingual, and being funded by the regional council, it takes it seriously. So it takes seriously that it serves the community, the region, not only the city of Budapest. Something that does happen with the national theater in Budapest, which apparently serves the nation of Budapest. <laughs> The same with Kaioba National Theater, we have several, seven nations served by the national theaters. Uh, and, uh, well, individually, uh, let's not go into this. You know, there's a large uh, bibliography about how much they hate our, our actors hated going in the, into the countryside. <laughs> it's stuff of the legend. And definitely, uh, definitely affected uh, how many, because it, it, it's a long story. We played here for, uh, between 1990 and 2004, uh, with a leg in 2008, we played here the centralization, decentralization, centralization, decentralization game. Uh, we ended up with uh, theaters being allocated to one authority or another according to whoever authority wanted them. So there's no plan why one theater is uh, subsidized by the local council and another one by the county. Uh, we don't even know why we have seven national theaters, but let's not go into them. Uh, 
into that issue. We have one national theater which is national, but it's subsidized by, uh, I don't know, so the, the, the local, local. Yeah, yes, the, local the city. Council, the city, council, yeah. city. So it is national. Yeah, the Tula calls themselves also national. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, but the, 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 but because the only reason was they played hide and seek with the theater in, in Galatz, for instance, in 1999. So it was given first to the uh, county council, so the regional council. Then it was, uh, 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 because the county council said we don't have money for it anymore, so you, you take it city hall. The city hall took it and get rid of the, of the manager the second day after. Uh, and, but the only reason was because the, the, the county said we don't have money this year, so we take it. So there's no, no uh, in, in, in the logic of things, according to the law and the public policies and blah, 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 a local theater should serve a local community, a county theater should serve the whole county, and the national theater, that's I don't know what to do. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 there is a question in Algeria theater history as well in the last 200 years, so we still don't know the answer. Yeah, okay. I, I wanted to ask you guys because, uh, you know, for, for those uh, still uh, not sleeping... Um, um, uh, no, 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 no. So, uh, it, it, so, you know, there is a question uh, that arises. So, all these models, they are very different, but there are some, of course, some parallel situations and some parallel solutions and so on. So there's a naive question, why don't these countries uh, communicate with each other? And maybe it's time to speak a bit about SPARS. Uh, if, if I am right, uh, this um, um, initiative tries to, to take this whole thing into a European level, uh, and I don't know if Claire or Chambor uh, would, would share some, some ideas on the working of, of SPARS because if I am right, it leaves behind this uh, national context in a way. So, what about this? Okay. So, SPARS um, is a project. It, the, the name SPARS stands for Supporting and Promoting Arts in Rural Settlements. Europe and as um, Chandra said earlier, the UK was a, a lead partner, not counter code, but um, a, a fellow ski was the lead partner in that project. And we, um, our role was really in mentoring um, for the four other partner countries Estonia, Lithuania, Italy, and Romania to set up rural touring models in those countries based on ours because we have this long-standing kind of established model. So the beginning of the project, um, all of the organisations visited Cornwall and identified local promoters within their regions or their countries. In Estonia it was a national project as you say. And the promoters came to Cornwall and we gave them a trip around and we took them to see a show. Um, we introduced them to our local promoters and some artists and we kind of for three days, we kind of immersed ourselves in all things rural touring, and the, the local promoters from each country got to know each other and their fellow promoters, and then they went back, they took that learning to their own countries, and then they set up these three tours, three tours on the project, wasn't it, um, in their own countries, and they were all slightly different, depending on the needs and the, the sort of, the um, parameters of their, their country's needs, so, um, Estonia, our partner, was the National Dance Agency, so they focused on dance performances, but they were national. In Lithuania, it was a regional project in, um, based in Klaipeda, around Western Lithuania. John was speaking about the Romanian model, and uh, in Italy, as you've seen, it was in the Marco. And we, the project was three years long. The pandemic was in the middle of it, so it kind of impacted the activity and the, um, the numbers, our target numbers, but we made a film, John did the evaluation of the project, and I think when we ended it at the end of last year, we all came together with the partners, and you know, the reflection was what an amazing um, 
three years it had been, what an amazing journey we've been on. And the network now will continue. The Creative Europe project has ended and the UK um, input has ended because of our already mentioned exit. <laughs> Um, but the network continues, we're inviting more partners, and I think we're waiting on um, the results of the funding as far as to what, what that will become and how that network will de de develop with additional partners. So, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, yeah maybe just um, that uh, Sparks was a project uh, funded by Creative Europe, but uh, during the project, other um, other organizations from different countries uh, approached us saying we would like to take part. So uh, basically, uh, at a certain point, we constituted what we call the Sparse Network, which is a network of about, I don't know, 25 organizations in different countries in, in Europe. Um, it's a, not a formal network, um, but it, it, what connects us, us is uh, these uh, shared aims. So uh, and this is something that anyone can, can, can join and we, we are trying to see in the future um, how we could function as a sort of a platform which would advocate uh, on a European level uh, for more serious funding for uh, arts in rural areas all around Europe. So this, this was the sparse and, and its little offsprings and potential, potential for developing. Yeah, so there is a European dialogue, or there might be a, a continuation of this, this dialogue. What has started with, with SPARS, so not only these separate models, national uh, uh, models, which is good to hear. Um, and of course, there are many, many questions uh, um, arise, but um, uh, I, I strongly recommend there's, um, uh, this nine minutes uh, long or short film uh, on the YouTube channel of, of to Cove, uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary, and it gives, uh, I think, a perfect impression on your work. And uh, and there are some there were some very interesting details for me in it. Uh, for example, uh, when when there is a sequence about about the, the genres, and there is a, a circus artist speaking that uh, with the help of the National Laboratory Forum, the uh, you know, they approached places they never imagined before. And, and I was thinking about, um, you know, so what, what is the, what are the, the, the ideal genres for, for rural touring? What is your experience? Uh, because, for example, circus and dance, as you mentioned in the Italian case, um, yeah, it, it, it sounds evident. Those still surprising, I think, for 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 many people, um, and you know, just you know, I think it would be nice to hear uh, a little about uh, about um, about uh, about the shows themselves. So so what are the I don't know the selection criteria, genre wise or length wise, technical wise, and so on. So just to be Um, well, personally, I don't think there's any show that can't be shown in a rural context, really. I mean, some need more work than others, um, but actually, I don't think it should be, a, you know, a, a negative in any company. I mean, the typical rural touring show is something that will go in the back of a van and can be driven by the actors who are also the technicians, the stage manager, the tour manager. So, you know, there is a kind of requirement to be flexible and to get on with you know, you turn up in a venue, you don't know what you're going to get. You might have an overhead light, you might have a rig, but you can't assume that you're going to have anything. So you need to be able to put your show on with what you can carry with you. Um, but, you know, in terms of genre, we have done circus tours and we've had Chinese poles in, in village halls. Um, we've done work outdoors and we've had, um, you know, contemporary dance, which has been, I mean, personally, I, I feel that watching a, a contemporary dance performance in a village hall is the best place to see it. You're so close. <laughs> you can see the, the, 
the sweat on the dancers' faces. You can hear the feet on the floor and you're part of it, you know? When I see a, a dance show in a, in a big theatre now, I feel so removed. It, it kind of takes, it's a different experience for sure. Um, so there is an intimacy in rural touring, but I don't think it should be a pro prohibition to anything really being on the programme. And we have had really successful, I mean, there is additional kind of funding required to tour a dance show because it has more infrastructure in it, you know, that the costs are larger, but it, it, anything can be possible. What about the artistic side? I mean, the artist side, so you just mentioned contemporary dance, uh, um, I think. Uh, uh, creators and artists of contemporary dance, they are used to different conditions, much different conditions. So what, what are the feedback, what is the feedback from, from for example, them? Well, I think it's fair to say that if you're an artist who is new to rural touring, there is an element of kind of learning that you have to, <laughs> that you, you, you have to go through. And so when we did the rural touring dance project, there was a, a, a lab that we set up for artists who hadn't worked on rural touring before but were interested. So it was a residential lab for three days where they came um, and they met um, volunteer promoters and they went to the Seat Village Hall and they kind of understood how their work might need to be adapted for a rural venue. You know, not having a dance floor is not impossible in, in a village hall, but it's Sometimes it does need, you know, a little bit of work, and you need to kind of tour around with the dance floor, and it kind of adds on to that thing. So there are expectations, I think, that need to be managed sometimes because, I, you know, I, I went to the Edinburgh Festival in August, and I met with some companies who said to me, "Come and see my show. I really want to rurally tour it." And then you go and chat to them, and, and you kind of think they don't really want to rurally tour it. They want their show to be brought to theatre spaces in, in rural lo locations, but we don't actually have them. So they have, you kind of have to talk to them about what is actually possible with their big sets and their large casts and the requirement for a dressing room and all this. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I just mentioned it before our discussion to John Moore that um, it might be a historical moment right now, you know, on the edge of everything, uh, the economic crisis, the pandemics, the war, and, and everything. And you know, this is a time when, uh, for example, in Hungary at least, uh, some theatres had to be closed down because they will not be able to pay the charges, so the gas and electricity. And I think uh, that's why talking about these different models uh, make a very strong sense today uh, because uh, as far as I can see and that is my question to you as well to all of you it might uh, so this, this this kind of rural touring uh, might show an escape route for for theaters in a way I think there's also um, the environmental kind of consideration touring is a bit not completely green, but it's a lot greener than running a big theatre. So the model of rural touring takes the show to people, and it, you know there is that kind of offsetting. So you know, as well as the economical, the economic factors, I think the environmental factors really do stand up. Yeah, so I'm curious, what is your opinion uh, on, on, on this topic? So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, you know, you only have one presentation there. 
So there's a whole thinking about how, how well, extending the network can also be, you know, as climate neutral as possible. Yeah, but of course, if you have, if you go there by your big truck and uh, if you have like four or five performances in the high close area. Yeah, you know, it, so it's not by itself. Mm -hmm. By itself, nothing is guaranteed. Not to mention that the whole, well, the whole global theater was running on touring. But it was, you know, touring by plane, which is not green at all. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, and on the other hand, we will see an increase of the use of technology on the par with going back to the analogic. But it, is, it doesn't prevent the, the need, the force need for the big theaters to just change their production models and to change their, well, the, the whole thing with the big theater. Because, you know, it's it's not doable to just imagine that you take all the artists out from Bucharest to just spread them doing the rural theater around. That's not going to happen, including because it's not financial, financially sustainable. And the financial sustainability and the human sustainability, human resources sustainability, are also important. Uh, again, just changing, uh, abandoning the whole of the big sets and the big theaters and going to smaller things all of a sudden has an impact on certain theatrical professions, on all the workshops, on all the production of, of those big sets because they are not robots doing them. They are sets of people and certain professions. Again, we still have to, so every, I think everything will change, uh, but uh, no, I don't know how ready everybody is, because in Romania at least, everybody's hanging from the doors of the big stone theaters, and they're still waiting for the state to pay the huge gas and electricity bills, because we don't want to think about uh, changing the lights of projectors, because you know a LED projector doesn't go black with enough speed. <laughs> and things like that. And again, uh, yes, uh, uh, we, in Romania, we have this, and it's same in Hungary, uh, and all over the region, we have these very big stone theaters built in another time with halls that are too large for one different audience, the current modes of production. Because already the, the, the production changed enough so that you, it's very difficult to find something, a product to do, do something for a thousand spectators at once. Yeah, but we are still, so we are moving to the inclusion. This, is, this happens in the Hungarian theater, for instance, uh, because the hall is, is so big. We move the spectators on the stage. It's the same in the Mumuresh, in, in another, a, a lot of places in, in Romania. Yeah, but they're still hitting the whole, the whole thing. It's, it's very, it's actually very, very delicate, and I think it's a good moment to just put a foot in the door. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So what about your foot in the door, John? What about the camera? <laughs> um, absolutely, I mean, a few years ago, I, 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 I was envisioning the same thing for myself. Like, okay, no, this, this has to stop. At some point in the future, uh, state theaters, these rock theaters, they will have to uh, realize that, that you cannot do sets with 150,000 euro and then play that performance three times and then take it off the program because you can do uh, 150. Thousand divided by seventeen thousand. How many? <laughs> how many affectionate projects can you do from just one set played three times? Almost ten. Eh? So, so somehow uh, we have to be forced into finding new ways. And I was thinking, in the next 10, 20 years, this change has to happen. And of course, the things and the critical moment that we are in is not very nice, but in a certain sense, 
I am happy for 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 this that maybe as you as you are saying maybe it's just it's the circumstances are just forcing us to do this and then there are some questions which we cannot uh, escape from anymore and it should be time to 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 look in the mirror and start asking uh, uh, answering these questions. The problem is, I think there is still and there will be a lack of communication between the, the upper levels and yeah. my foot. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, <laughs> I can try to keep the door, but I, I, uh, I keep getting the, the impression that I am kicking a door which is actually a wall and I, I went, you know, I went, and the porter said, oh yeah, there's the door. You go, yeah, that's, that's go. what I wanted to say, that in Eastern Europe first you have to find the right door. Exactly. So that's the first. Or put, a, put in all the doors. Yeah, that's the first. <laughs> For this, you have to be a sort of a superman, because in the previous panel we heard from the colleagues how difficult all of this is, so it's still a mystery to me, even though I think, yes, the time is, maybe it's, it's good, because of the circumstances, it's still a mystery to me whether we will be strong enough, have energy enough, or if we will have the critical mass. And for instance, we have this pilot project with 4 million, 4 million euros, yes, which is very nice. We have to spend it because otherwise we will not be able to do our highways. Uh, but this is a pilot project. What is going to happen afterwards? This is my question. Is it going to, are the the people who give the money, will they ever think about, oh, how nice, we should do a second, a third, a thirtieth, a fiftieth? You know, it depends on the results. That's, that's the thing with pilots, you know? Because, you know, I have, what, what if it proves a, a huge burden to find enough local authorities interested in giving five euros? Because you know it's it's something for the community. We cannot keep on enlightening communities by deciding from the above and from bureaucrats what they have to do within their own communities. That's the whole idea with the co local co-financing, because they have to be willing to have this within their community. You know if. This pilot proves that there's not enough local authorities willing to do it because there's, you know, it's European condition, it has, you have a number there. It's not like we give you the money, the, you know, and we are Romanians so between the European Commission and Romania, I imagine. Um, so then you go back, you know, and you go back and you devise, you, you the Apechene, the model, you devise a strategy in order to increase the interest either through you know the carrot or the stick for the local authorities you know because all the data that's a pilot it, it gives you data it gives you information and then you can go further it's you you don't do the second one the same you take the data from the first one and you adjust it so that it can work. And it can work, it, it can be done with the, the money in the chene. You can, it can be done in many, many other ways. But you know, it's like jumping to the next level. Let's see what this, this, pro, this program brings back as data. Because if it proves that the local communities don't want culture, then you have to go back and find it a way to either convince them, or force them, or a <laughs> combination of both. Yeah. Okay, guys. Chongo, um, are you a fire me if I don't stop this conversation? And we don't oh, no, me, me, me. No, 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 he will fire me. No, I changed my mind. <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, uh, maybe it's a time when we can we can ask Gobi, Gobi Bartolish, uh, um, if if you have anything to add. I don't know. Uh, and I think.
Okay, and Chong will be a translator. Thank you. 
întâmplare foarte bine că am avut de aceste fonduri și uh, chiar vreau să transmit directorilor să, uh, să se folosească de aceste So this kind of practice, it stopped in 2018, once the former director of their theater uh, left, um, and also the, the, the town, the people who were running the town changed, and so the new, new system, the new people, the new mayor, they were uh, asking for a much higher uh, price, so they were saying that the, the, the local uh, the villages should pay for themselves completely, which then made it impossible for them to bring these productions uh, because they didn't have any more subsidy. Um, at the same time, the mayors are still telling them that, oh, we would like to have you back and, and so on. And, and Julia was uh, whispering to my, to my ear here, uh, yes, but are they willing to pay? So, yes, exactly. There is a difference between, oh, we would like it so much, and between what am I willing to, to, to do. And just one other thing that Gabi mentioned, that in the meantime, these culture houses uh, in, the, in the region became renovated, um, so now they would have better conditions if they would return to this kind of practice. And I think Claudio wanted to... Three things, but very short. One, I don't think uh, we should talk about, we should speak about the willingness of paying a uh, cultural service. It's about the capacity of the local authorities to cover these expenses. There are uh, villages, administrations, that they, they don't have money for their own employees. I know a few cases, I have relatives that work in the local administration and I, I, I know from the direct source this situation. So, uh, they all rely, unfortunately, on the county council uh, mercy to get funds for different things from uh, uh, building up a, a street in, in, their, in, in their village up to cultural services and everything. Uh, about the touring, uh, a lot of uh, local theatres in Romania, mostly children's theatres, as Julia mentioned, but also drama theatres, are touring in the region, near region, especially those ones that depend, that, that are subsidized by the uh, regional uh, councils, because the managers have their managing program, this uh, activity. Uh, of course, they don't tour, unfortunately, at the countryside. But in the small uh, cities, towns in, in, in that area, because usually uh, the infrastructure in the villages uh, area is very poor. So, as uh, uh, Gabi you mentioned, if, if you have a spectacle prepared in a professional theater in a certain infrastructure, it would be very difficult to play on a on the countryside. But there are theaters touring, so this is a model that could be improved and developed. And so on. Uh, the third thing is like a personal uh, observation. Last year I was one of the uh, curators of the National uh, Theatre Festival, which was held online only. And it was a really, really moving surprise. After the festival, the, uh, the organizers, our friends from UNITER, that are the producers of this festival, sent us some emails uh, reached from the uh, spectators, from the audience all over the country, from villages, from small towns and cities and so on, uh, uh, thanking us for uh, uh, broadcasting online the festival so they could see productions that would be very difficult to attend in normal conditions. So, maybe these are some points we could create a frame and develop in different ways. I don't know. We should, we should speak about that. Yeah, but at this time. So thank you for sh sharing this last thing. I think it's, it's extremely important. And we had the same experience in Hungary, actually with uh, you know the uh, all these online streaming shows and so on and so on so the access
accessibility in a country where there is practically no cultural mobility raised to heaven. So, and, and, uh, and you know, uh, we, we also have some data, some statistics saying that, uh, for example, from these online streaming uh, theater shows, like 60% of the spectators are from the countryside, from places uh, that never get a theatrical, a high quality theatrical experience. So that means something, and maybe the decision makers one day realize that there is something Okay, thank you very much for Claire Marsha, Julia Popovic and Chombor Köhler for being here today. Thank you for all your questions. Our guests are still available, but we have to stop this now because Chombor will present two books and we have a five minutes break, right? Yes, I propose, um, I propose is it okay if we meet at quarter to six? Yeah. And, then I, and, then, and then I will make a 15 minute presentation. And then coffee break. Okay. Thank you very much.